I am uh, Greg Carpenter, uh, former NSA guy, outed on WikiLeaks, so I get to come out here and do stuff now and meet real people, so it's nice. Um, I have an interesting, I think it's an interesting talk today, uh, I've studied for the last couple of years now, uh, pulling information from uh, Russian and Chinese curriculum at their uh, military universities. And we're going to take a look at how that ties to national strategic goals, their philosophy and their strategy. So uh, this is pretty much it's a no Sun Tzu zone, so no quotes from Sun Tzu for anybody out here today, okay? I don't want to hear any. Uh, quick agenda, just so you can see where we're going to go. Pretty straightforward, Chinese history influences how they're working it today and how it links to national goals, and the same thing with Russia. One thing that's common in both Chinese and Russian and, I would say, American psychological warfare and information warfare strategies are basically controlling the language, controlling the meaning of words. Russia has a deep-rooted history in this. China's come along just in the last hundred years or so and started to focus on epistemology and ontology, basically the meaning of words and the meaning of reality. I think Philip Dick said it best because it's the basis for all three psychological warfare programs. Um, I'm doing some work on Iran right now, too. Um, like to have that soon. Theirs is a little bit different approach, but they use the same concept as put out by Philip Dick. So standard disclaimer from NSA, I got to tell you this because this is, if I don't say this, they told me I get to go to jail, um, which is fine. I uh, met a lot of good people there, so that's that. So let's start talking about Chinese influences real quick. Now, everyone, pretty much everyone's heard of Sun Tzu, which is probably why you're here, okay, um, the whole art of war. And that's about as much as we're going to talk about him. Now, even though he is the seminal historical figure in Chinese information warfare, he's not the only one taught at the universities. China focuses on these seven military classics. Of course, the first is the art of war. Has anyone heard of these other books that are in Chinese curriculum at all? A few. Okay, great. That's great. So think of it this way. The art of war is considered or understood to be the oldest influence in Chinese strategy and philosophy right now. But these other books, four of them came, across, uh, came out during the warring period back when China was consolidating into one national entity. The rest of them came on 1600s or so, but they're all a different twist on strategy. For example, the three strategies is directly translated into Mao Zedong's art of war, which we'll go through a little bit later. Of course, Mao had to have his own art of war because he can't be left out, right? Um, Wu Zi, the uh, fourth one down, basically talked about, as a politician, how do you manipulate and influence other politicians? And how do you manipulate and influence the public, not only your public, but everybody else? So each of these connects back to the Chinese strategy of influencing everyone in different ways. But wait, there's more. Anybody hear of Sun Bin, Sun Tzu's uh, relative. No. So until 1972, all of Sun Bin's work, that's his picture there in the middle, by the way, um, all of his work was considered to be Sun Tzu's work. And Sun Tzu's Art of War was this huge piece, only until they found the documents from Sun Bin in 1972 when they were excavating one of the emperor's grave sites, did they realize that they had more than one document. Now, other documents in here, like the Book of Swindles, is not a strategic book. It's basically, um, you could use it at the lockpicking village because it's for thievery. But it's linked back to, conceptually, a philosophy on how to manipulate other people. So all of these books are extremely interesting and important in Chinese philosophy because they're all taught today. 
the periods in China that were the most influential and had the biggest impact on how China would engage the rest of the world was during, number one, the Warring States period, back 500 or so BC to 200 BC, right? Each of the different uh, parts of China were fighting for autonomy and control over the rest of China. And there was, you know, uh, consolidation in, two, uh, I think, 220 BC or something like that. That's when the art of war was actually consolidated into a national program. Not like we'd know a national program today, but it was the emperor's philosophy at the time to control and manage the population in China as one China. The century of humiliation was from 1839 to 1949. And what happened in that period? Well, you had the Opium Wars, the Boxer Rebellion. There were numerous treaties that China was forced to sign where they got the raw end of the deal, specifically from the West. They considered the West to be extremely uh, manipulative of their national sovereignty and national goals. So they take great offense to the West in many ways. And you'll see that when we get into the curriculum a little bit later. And then 8129, anybody know that date by chance? It's on, their, it's on the flag. It's a People's Liberation Army. That's the date that it was formed. And the star and the uh, Chinese characters for 8-1, um, Gao Yat. So here's a copy of, yeah, over here. <laughs> here's a copy of the syllabus in the Chinese, in the National Defense University of the People's Liberation Army. Uh, I pulled this out of their, um, uh, their website, uh, their internal website, and if you look closely, you'll see, and I'll translate it for you basically, um, item number one is Chinese national defense, number two is China's armed forces, and then they get into the international and how to develop the army. Number five of topics is Mao Zedong's art of war. Mao is the first theory taught linking Chinese teaching to Chinese strategic goals. After that, it's Sun Tzu. Number six is Sun Tzu. And it goes into uh, seven is the military revolution. And then number eight is information warfare. It's not kinetic warfare. It's all information warfare. Because 95% of the Chinese historical uh, background for teaching and understanding information warfare is about non-kinetic activity. It's not about kinetic activity. All those books that I showed you, and, and if anybody wants uh, the references and have some other stuff, um, there'll be a PDF available uh, for anybody to download later on. Um, but the information warfare aspect, the number eight, is extremely important because that includes all of the other authors. Now, some of them are intermingled in number five, which is Mao Zedong's Art of War, like I talked about the three strategies before, but it's all right here. Everything from the warring period, from the age of humiliation, everything is right here in this orientation to the National Defense University. So immediately, first thing up, you come in. These guys here are the teachers of the class. In Mao Zedong's Art of War, it kind of sums up what Japanese, uh, Japanese, Chinese uh, internal philosophy is in how China fits in, in the universe. China compared to the rest of the environment and with the rest of the international community, how they see themselves and how they plan their strategy. So, for example, if the foe moves in, I scram. That's a rough translation, right? It, it applies to information warfare in the same manner that it applies to a kinetic activity. So if you're hunting and you're chasing Chinese guys on the web, for the most part, if you try to go after them, they'll disappear on you and you won't find them. And some groups stay around, but for the most part, they'll, they'll go away. 
we were working a number of years ago with uh, APT1 and a guy named Ugly Gorilla, uh, Wang Dong. And he literally, anytime that we came across him or found him on a computer anywhere, he was gone like a ghost. So Chinese philosophy is definitely linked to Mao Zedong's interpretation and understanding of the historical books. But externally from China out, they study Americans and they study Russians in the same way that we try to study their uh, te uh, techniques, tools, procedures, things like that. This is also, um, this website is also from the uh, State Controlled Information Office. So their plan is to not only teach the people that are going into the military, but uh, the general population. So the State Controlled Information Office broadcasts to the rest of the population in China. And there's tons of documents on there. You can go there and download every, any, anything you want about what China is teaching the people of China and how they should act and interact with foreigners. Uh, an interesting note here, this is the, uh, this is the most interesting classes in the, the PLA National Defense University. And you can see there, uh, the fifth most popular class is the art of war. And that is uh, Sun Tzu, Sun Bin, and Mao Zedong's philosophy all linked together. And the key thing here is that all of these classes, the top classes, all involve elements of understanding human behavior, decision making, uh, or systems of organization, I would say, right? So to understand from the individual up to the strategic level in any organization is how China looks at uh, implementing a different uh, information environment for you to operate in. So we all know that the information environment is a contested environment. Chinese philosophy is to let it be contested, let it be confusing, like in a Clausewitz type of a way, but that gives us exactly what we need to not apply kinetic resources to achieve our sovereignty. And Chinese sovereignty is basically regional control. They're looking to be a regional power. Uh, in 2000, there was a great book that came out uh, on the National Defense University Press by Michael Pillsbury called China Debates Future Security Environment. And in there, he lays out how Chinese generals and politicians uh, understood how easy it would be for North Korea to defeat the United States in a one-on-one -on -one war. And that caused me to think for a minute because the disparity of how we would look at a war with North Korea and how China looked at it was extremely interesting to me. And it told a lot about the Chinese understanding of what they believe the information environment really is. They see America declining, and by 2032, will be a regional power, the same as Russia, and the same as China. They see themselves rising, and they see us declining. And this is in a balanced world. Let's go to Russia for a minute. Uh, Russia had three significant periods of influence into their information warfare strategy and philosophy. Uh, the pre-Kremlin pre period, uh, Lenin, Marx, their theory on war, and the development of military theory under recent Soviet leadership in the late 70s, early 80s. The biggest impact on Russian control of information was the Slavophile and westernizers fight that was happening in the 1800s. Russia was an imperial power and more than half, I would say, of the population or at least the imperial court believed that Russia could be strong by itself, separate from Western influence. 
The Westernizers were the people in the court who wanted to be able to influence uh, the Russian philosophy for socioeconomic power structure, uh, politics from Western democracy. And, and during this period of time, significant propaganda was actually infused into the Russian population, which kind of changed uh, how things had operated from the 1600s, 1500s or so. Russia became a much more censored country even back then, and it followed through, and it's still a significant part of the strategy today. Yeah. So um, in Russia, you see, uh, to this day, you still see state-controlled media. Uh, state-controlled newspapers were a big thing back during the Slavophile Westernizer fight uh, back in the 1800s. And the idea for Pravda came out of that historical aspect of controlling the information environment. Uh, fast forward a few years, we get into the Cold War aspect of it. And the Cold War was, uh, let's start with World War II first, sorry about that. Uh, World War II was a significant uh, event for Russia, right? It was, um, um, how would you say? More Russians died, right? The population shift in Russia was huge compared to pretty much any other country in the world. And that really affected politics in Russia. It became a much more closed society and started to close even tighter, which meant that they had more control over their information. Into the Cold War period, the U.S. started to infuse Russia because they saw them as a threat, right, with more propaganda at every aspect they could. Um, we, I mean, we sent Louis Armstrong over, right, to Europe to tour throughout Europe to teach people that America was better than Russia. We, we did some very popular and interesting things. Uh, Jackson Pollock, famous painter, right, paid through a third party, through the CIA, to go make art, art, you know, dripping paint on a drop cloth to show Russia that we were much more advanced in an artistic manner. So the Russians, what they did was they actually sent people over to be art critics in the States. And there's many cases of this where they became the people to judge what art was. So we were giving them and saying, this is great art. Then they sent us art critics to counterbalance. And this type of a back and forth control of information happened all the way through the 80s. And it wasn't until uh, the early 90s or so when there was a change that the big propaganda that went against each country started to subside a little bit. And Russia focused more internally on, again, going back to the base and population and propagandizing them. So. That's the background of the Russian uh, history. Now, this is basically a list of all the universities in Russia from the Ministry of Defense's website, uh, their internal website, showing everyone that conducts information warfare and propaganda integrated with offensive cyber actions. So, and again, this will be available. Anybody you want to go there, uh, you know, you figure out how to get in. Um, the big picture on the right is just big enough so you can see it. Um, but they literally have information warfare and propaganda integrated into everything that they teach. It's not separate. A little different from the Chinese model. So let's talk about how they're similar first. Both Russia and China, and the U.S., by the way, all focus on psychological operations and influence campaigns at a strategic level and at a tactical level. If information can be infused in a tactical level that will actually affect national policy, it'll happen. Just think of any incident that had 
it was a one-off, you would call it, that had strategic influence. A number of years ago, there was a guy who was caned, American, who was caned in Thailand, right? He violated a very simple law, right? How do you think that played in Russian propaganda, in Chinese propaganda against the United States as the unruly, the people that won't follow or respect other laws? It played extremely well to their base. And of course, both are affected by uh, historical injuries that happened to them from the West, like for the last couple hundred years. Um, differences. The context and how Russia operates and how China operate are completely, uh, I would say, unique to their culture. China controls vast numbers, and they have a bunch of attackers, they have a bunch of defenders, and they're integrated, and some are really loud, you may have noticed, and some are really stealthy, and you really don't know what you get. And sometimes the Chinese will come in and they'll do OSINT on a website, you know, and they'll leave the language se setting to Russian. So, it, you know, on first glance, you're looking at a Russian. No, you're not. You're looking at somebody else, just look at the searches, okay? So China will come in and do a whole bunch of different types of operations. On the other hand, the Russians will come in very strategic and they try to be really good about how they're operating because limited resources in Russia only allow them to do onesies, twosies in a very strategic manner, directly linked to national strategies. So, in short, uh, these two guys are still directing and managing national strategy and philosophy, but it's only based and only linked to the historical injuries that China and Russia have had incurred on them from the West. And with that, I'll leave it up if anybody has any questions at all. No. Okay, fair enough. So as I promised, no Sun Tzu, okay? We didn't give any theory on Sun Tzu, thank God, but th there's a Twitter, the Discord, all that stuff. If you want a copy of the slides, you know, hit me up and I'll send you a PDF, uh, including all the references uh, and you can have at it yourself. Uh, thank you very much.